Okay, ladies and gentlemen, thanks for coming back to the podcast. Today's special guest is Mr. J.R. Walker from uh, Southern Virginia. J.R., good to have you on. Hi, Richard. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah. So I say you're from Southern Virginia. You were. Uh, we talked a little bit before the interview, but you are now in Orlando. Is that correct? Yes, I am in Disney, the Disney realm. Yes, Orlando, <laughs> Florida. That's the crazy, <laughs> crazy part of the country for sure. There's a lot going on there. And yeah. it's especially busy right now with, you know, spring breaks and all that stuff. So it's it's interesting for sure. Right. Well, let's get started uh, giving us a little bit of context to your Irish dance background before we work into your, your latest accomplishment, which we'll talk about here in just a little bit. Uh, talk about the origins. Uh, how old were you? What got you involved in Irish dancing? Yeah, so I started late. Um, I was 13 when I took my very first class. So a little bit older than most people start. And I had just recently moved to Williamsburg. And I had, there was a girl in my class at school that did Irish dancing. And um, she ended up becoming a really close friend with my group of friends. And I, would, I was so interested by it because I had never heard about it before. I'd never seen river dance or anything like that. And um, she, you know, was like, I do Irish dancing and showed me her shoes. And then I saw all the tapes and all, you know, the, <laughs> the shows. And I'm like, this is so cool. So after a whole, uh, my eighth grade year, or excuse me, my seventh grade year of talking about it, talking about it, talking about it, my mom finally said, I'm going to sign you up for this because all you do is talk about how cool this is. And I said, you know, no, I don't want to do it. I'm scared to try it or whatever. And sure enough, my first dance teacher had a new beginner class for uh, teenagers. So that was really great. And there was about six of us. Um, all around the same age. And that was that was where I started right in Williamsburg, Virginia. Yep. Okay, so so talk about your earliest teachers. Who was your first teacher and talk about your career progression from there? Yeah, my very, very first teacher. I was just talking to her the other day um, when I got my results. Uh, her name well, at the time was Lisa Hunt and she's now Lisa Burgess okay. and she's a TMRF. Okay. Um, and she had uh, taught a satellite location for the school um, on Corrud at the time was the mm -hmm. name of the school under uh, Heather Esposito. So she was based in Virginia Beach, but she would drive up and do a class in Williamsburg and Richmond once a week just to help, you know, to spread it out and, and get some more kids involved. Uh, so I just loved it. I mean, I was it was every Thursday for one hour. I remember it. And that was what I looked forward to every single day or every, every single week, you know, that right. was just the next class. Um, and she was, she was just awesome. She really was, you know, patient and just a great teacher. And we actually, when I had my own school in Virginia beach, she was on my teaching staff as well. Um, and a really great teams teacher as well. And really helped learn, you know, mm -hmm. helped teach me. Irish dancing and love it. Okay. Uh, what do you recall, uh, JR, about those early classes you took? Maybe some of the, I don't know, some of the, the rituals that, you know, go along with different schools and different classes, maybe some of the sayings your teachers had. Uh, what do you recall there? So I think specifically, I remember always wanting to get into hard shoe and always mm -hmm. hearing the class that was after me, they were doing hard shoe. And just, you know, uh, doing the drilling and saying out the different things and the steps. And that was what I really wanted to do, too. Of course, everyone wants to, you know, start getting hard shoes as quick as they can, right? Yeah. But, um, you know, you have to go through the basics and all that. So uh, just really being interested and curious about everything. I asked tons of questions, always wanted to know what is this and what does this mean? And you know, just I was always asking questions and looking at things online. I was literally obsessed, mm -hmm. obsessed. <laughs> <laughs> OK, yeah. well, did you do anything uh, maybe before or during your Irish dance career outside of, of Irish dancing? Did you did you have a hobby or some other pastime that you did beforehand or while you're doing it? No, I actually didn't. I did, you know, piano. I tried a couple different things, but this was, I mean, it was crazy how much it just blew up for me. I had never really been, had no dance background, no music really, um, except a little bit of piano, but 
this was my first real hobby and really the only one that I've kind of kept um, and stayed interested with. Mm -hmm. When did the the newness wear off you know like anytime you you get involved with something there's the newness of all of it and it's especially irish dancing is you know it's very unique it's kind of its own thing yeah it's a dance form but i mean it's not like any of the rest of them but in time i mean that whole like a new gift you know it it gets not old but it's it's you start to get used to it again uh, or you get used to it i should say and then it's like okay well what's keeping me going to class the newness is wear it off what was it for you that kept you going that's a good question. So that it wore, it was the competition started. Mm-hmm. I started doing my first fashion. I, uh, you know, was going through the grades. I went through the grades very quickly and then got to championship level. And I was like, okay, this is harder. <laughs> now. <laughs> now I have to do three steps and, uh, it's a little, it takes a little bit more stamina and hard work outside. Um, but, you know, what kept me going was the interest in kind of, I guess, like the longevity of it and how you could see yourself doing this for such a long time. And I loved helping other dancers. Mm-hmm. And I knew, I mean, probably the first two years of me dancing, I knew I wanted to be a teacher and I knew I wanted to be an adjudicator. I knew that. So I, that was kind of where I was focused at that point. Um, and it it kind of that I had to reach that goal and that never stopped. Hmm. Okay. And so along the way in your uh, competitive career, where did your destinations take you? Did you, obviously you did the local feshes. Did you do uh, different uh, Iraq to I guess it'd be, you'd be in the Southern region there. Did you do all that and the nationals in the world scene or did, did you say more local or talk about your path there? So actually a lot of people don't know this, I have never danced on a world stage before. Mm. Um, I have never, I've qualified, I'm qualified, I think three times at the Oireachtas, um, but I never actually went. Um, so I don't have a very extensive competitive background. Mm. I really don't. Um, it, I think I, in combination of being older and, you know, I ended up, I did switch schools when I moved up to Richmond for college. Um, which was a whole different experience for me and what a combination of being older and I just always loved being on the background and just helping Uh, there's no people that dance with me growing up will kind of know that that I was a good dancer but I just I I would be the person that would show up to the fest and just I'm like I don't feel like dancing I just want to watch and help you and and do that kind of stuff because I just I just didn't have that interest for myself. And, you know, of course, looking back, I should have, you know, pushed and done a worlds and, you know, all that stuff. But, um, I, you know, I, it kind of, I feel like that helped me, you know, I just was so interested in choreography and helping and, oh, let's put this here just at a young age. And that's kind Mm -hmm. of where my interests were. Hmm. Well, we have a, a, an interesting, I guess, something in common there because I qualified a number of times and never went myself either. So that's an interesting perspective. It's the first that I've had on this podcast. I don't have anyone else that's had that experience. And, you know, I know talking to my peers at the time, uh, you know, going back 20, 25 years ago or something like that. And they were when I decided I wanted to teach, they said, well, have you done enough? Have you asked yourself that question? You know, are you ending on a high note? Are you content with what you did? Or are there any regrets? Maybe you want to go back and do one of those world championships. And I said, no, I left on a high note, like kind of like you, I was at that point to where I loved the competitions. Uh, They pushed me, but it was time to, I wanted to start giving back like you were saying you did. So it sounds like there's some, some parallels between our stories there. Did you, uh, and, and sort of leading into this question, did you find yourself in the same situation where you're asking yourself, Am I content with what I've done before you go to the next chapter? Yes, yes. And, you know, for a very long time, I was very insecure about a little bit about, oh, well, you know, I didn't do this competitively or I didn't join Riverdance or, you know, this, that and the third. And I could have if I really, you know, if I would have put my head, my mind to it. Um, But that was uh, something that I struggled with early in my teaching career, I think, of 
being like, well, I didn't, you know, I didn't do this and I didn't do that. But as time went on, I kind of just said, let, I just let, let it go and let the dancing and my students and my teaching kind of do the talking, I guess. And, and, you know, people would see that I loved it and, you know, I had a passion for it and I've really, you know, grown out of that as the years have gone on and, you know, no one's ever in the Irish dance community has made me feel Mm-hmm. Like I'm less than or right. or anything. I mean, everyone's just been so great, and we're we have a very professional relationship. Mm-hmm. And so you talked about uh, when you went to college and you had to join a different school, and it was a different experience. What did you mean by that? So when I went to uh, VCU, which is a, a college in Richmond, Virginia, I was studying to be a high school teacher, social studies teacher. And I wanted to um, keep dancing. And my original teacher had a location there, um, but that was kind of, you know, winding down and she was doing things with her family. And it was a, it was a trek to come up from Virginia Beach. Mm -hmm. So I ended up um, moving to the Brosler School, which was in Baltimore at the time. And um, I had, I was Kevin, Eileen, and... Um, a little bit of Megan Harper too, were my teachers. And it was a, it was just invaluable, honestly, what I learned. And it it was, we had great dancers at my school, my original school, but this school was much, much bigger Mm -hmm. and, um, you know, had kids on the podium at Worlds and things like that. And it was just, it was such a great experience for me. And I think that, you know, really helped me, helped solidify for me that this was what I wanted to do. And I I wanted to teach and I wanted to, you know, bring kids from the beginner level to championship and help them get to a world and things like that. So it was Hmm. just the hard work and crazy hours. I mean, it, it was just, it was mind blowing to me. It was really cool. Mm -hmm. You talk about the crazy hours and the hard work that goes into whether you're, you know, you're a high level teacher or a high level competitor. I mean, there we all know if you've done this long enough, there's a lot of sacrifice and it can lead to if you're not careful and don't have life balance, it can lead to a very lonely existence. Did you go through any of that yourself? Yes, I did. I did when I was when I was, you know, I had so I ended up coming back down and um, at the time. Encore Rudd was closing and um, Heather was getting ready to retire. So I had just gotten my TCRG um, and I took over the school at that point. And I did that for about five years. And it is, I mean, I, you know, it was, it, it was kind of lonely and, you know, the, it was a little bit of hard work and, you know, a lot, a lot of hard work with the kids and, you know, it's, it's hard doing it alone. I think more than anything, which people don't really understand Mm -hmm. as much. Um, But that was tough Mm -hmm. for sure. Did you, when did you know it was time to sit the TCRG though? I know you you talked a little bit about, you know, coming to the conclusion of your competitive career, going into another school and getting a little bit different experience uh, perspective there. When -hmm. did you say, right, okay, I've got some great experience. I've got some things hanging on the mantle, all these, you know, competitive accomplishments, but it's time to make this, not just wanting to teach, but make the first move to actually setting up a school. Yeah. So that was in 2014 because I had just moved down. Um, I had graduated from college and I came back and just, you know, for fun, just was dancing in, in the Encore Ed classes at the time. And then, uh, you know, I, I, they, Heather and Lisa always knew that I wanted to do my teacher's exam. And then, you know, they were very great to let me, you know, Hey, come teach the kids some Kaylee's come teach some solo steps and, and things like that and practice your dancing. And that was when I knew I, I was like, okay, this is, I need to set this exam and um, really start preparing. So the whole first year of me as a high school teacher, I spent also preparing for my <laughs> TCRG. So that was very difficult, um, but you know we we got it done. So right, uh, Jr. Juxtapose the difference between getting your your education in college, uh, the university system, as it were, and, and becoming a public school teacher. 
and the process of taking the Irish dance teachers exam, because as we all know, regardless of what organization you're in, they all have their own version of a teacher's exam and none of them are easy. But if you get to talking to people, most say this is this is a really strange system compared to if, like if you've been formally trained to become a public school teacher or another kind of teacher, it's a different kind of system. How would you compare for, for someone who may be watching this who's not steeped in Irish dancing or doesn't know much about uh, the, the teaching side of it? How would you explain it to them and, and your different experiences getting two different teachers credentials? Yes, yeah, so um, I'll kind of start with just like a unique similarity of the two is you have the hands on approach. You have to be you have to do your student teaching for your degree for your final um, your certification for the high school teaching and you, you're doing you're really doing more student teaching and hands on teaching with the Irish dancing because you're preparing for so long and really everything's prepared you for that moment so I think I will say it's a lot less paperwork with mm -hmm. the Irish dance exam than it was right. with you know getting my master's degree but um, it, it was it, it's so different I mean I'm trying to think of some other some other things about it it's it's just it was crazy and especially you know just finishing one and then going into the other one at the same time was it was a very unique experience <laughs> mm -hmm. what did you find uh to be the hardest part of preparing for the tcrg the hardest part for me preparing was the uh kaylee teaching mm -hmm. for me uh that was something that we had not done a lot of when i was growing up i did I did some uh, Kaylee's at the Oroctus, um, some four hands and eight hands and things like that. But um, we didn't do a lot of the other ones. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, that was hard for me. And I remember, and I always tell everybody this, that's sitting the TCRG exam. It's very different when you have kids standing in front of you because you have to think, you can't really say turn anti-clockwise mm -hmm. because a nine-year-old is going to go, what is that? You know? Right. So you have to think of unique ways of teaching these different dances. And I just remember getting so frustrated sometimes in the middle of practicing my teaching. I'm like, how am I going to explain this? And, you know, I have to rethink how to do that. So that for me took the longest. Mm -hmm. That was the hardest part, I think, for the specific sections. Right. Well, and it's all I, I think, you know, talking to people and I've, I've said the exam before myself and I mean, the hardest thing is you get used to teaching your own dancers, Kaylee, and what they look like. And, you know, even if it's it's eight ladies, you still know who's the gent because they're always the gent, you know. Uh, but when you go into that exam and they they say, hey, pick eight dancers and set up the eight hand jig and all different ages, heights, and, you know, everything else. And it's like, wait a minute, they don't look like the ones I'm used to teaching. <laughs> you know? Exactly. Yeah. 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 And you have to come up with the little tricks of, I, yeah. I remember we had this, I brought the soccer pennies into my exam oh. and to, to um, designate the gents, the gents would wear the soccer pennies, like a really annoying bright green or something like yeah. that, just so I could visualize where all of them are, because you're right. It's, you have these kids and you're there nervous because they don't know who you are. And they, and I really believe those kids that are the um, dancers in the exams, they want to do well by you. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they know it's important to you too. So it's just trying to get all that, you know, or organized at once is a lot. So that was hard. Right. So you get through your results in you're, you know, thankfully you're successful. You were successful your first attempt or did you have to redo? No, I wasn't. So I had to actually retake the solo teaching. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, okay. Did. Yeah, that happens. Um, yeah. And totally deserve to. Um, I made a huge mistake. And, um, you know, I passed everything else the first time and I had to go back six months later and I did the solo teaching and then got it that time. So you know, you live and you learn, but mm -hmm. I had to go back and I got it the next time. Was there ever any doubt in your mind after you received an unsuccessful result? You're looking at that and you go, oh man, just one, you know, one section. Obviously you scored enough to where you own high enough where you only had to retake the one and not all of it all over mm -hmm. again. But was there ever a time, uh, JR, that you said, oh, you know, I put all this effort into that. I don't know if I want to do this. Or was there no doubt you were going to keep going until you finished? Absolutely. No doubt. I yeah. was, let me get on the email and get on the next one. There was no question in my mind. And 
it was, you know, there was absolutely no question. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, you probably know people, I know people who would get, you know, maybe a mark like that, or maybe even more drastic than that would be, let's say you failed a section that would require sitting the entire exam again. And they may say, you know, I just don't want to know if I want to go through all that. You start doubting yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, we all know people who, who deal with stuff like that. If there's someone watching this video, then maybe find yourself in the same situation because these results just came out, TCRG and ADCRG for on commission. There's some people who did not get the, the, the nice positive email that, that many of you did. If you could talk to them for a second, how would you encourage them to keep going if they're kind of on that do I or do I not seesaw? I, you know, this is my thing is clearly they put the work in to do this because they love it. Um, otherwise, they wouldn't have. And, you know, I think that there are so many people that, you know, have maybe just for example, for the adjudicators result that have said, oh, you know, I'm just going to hold off a couple years or maybe, maybe I'm not going to try for it again that, you know, would just be fantastic judges. And I think it would, you know, it would be great for the kids to have them in front of them. And um, I just encourage anybody because it, uh, I mean, I really did experience it. I, I had to retake one section of my TCRG and I just, I knew, you know, of course it's frustrating and give yourself that time to be frustrated and upset, but then get back into it again. You know, you have to set an example for your students as well, right. um, that it's not always going to go your way. And, mm -hmm. you know, how are you going to pull yourself back up and get stronger for the next time? Mm -hmm. So once you got that, that overall final result and it was, you know, bona fide TCRG, uh, what was the first step in actually getting your own classes, your own name, everything going? So that was not until 2018. Um, okay. I had taught alongside um, with Encore Rudd for about, I guess it was a year and a half since I had gotten my exam. And then uh, to the end of 2017, Heather um, was going to retire. And then I took over as Walker Academy in 2018. Okay. Um, but I had been teaching and choreographing for, you know, for the kids ever since I moved down to back to Virginia Beach. Mm -hmm. Okay. Some of the challenges that you may have faced, you know, once you're getting out there and you're doing your own thing, you know, it's one thing to, to be under the tutelage of a teacher that's got experience and they kind of put the arm over the shoulder and say, ah, don't do this. This don't work. Trust me. You know, that that mentorship, if you will. Uh, talk about the difference between having that and having to figure it all out on your own. It was very difficult, I will I will say. And, you know, I, of course, you know, my friends, there's so many people in the Irish dance community that are just fantastic and are ready to help at a moment's notice with, you know, what do you do for this? What do you do for that? But there were so many times where I'm like, wait, I have my own school now. What do I do about um, getting kids shoes when they're beginners? What do I do about telling them how to sign up for feshes? I was like, oh man, what do I do about this? So I had to figure out a lot of stuff on my own mm -hmm. um, and, you know, kind of create my own templates and design my own things. Um, but I would be a fool to say that I didn't go to help to reach out to other people for help because I absolutely did. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, now somewhere along the way you moved to Orlando. So what was that, that transition like going from, you know, uh, Virginia to, to Orlando and getting set up there in a new city? It was, it was, it's been harder. Um, I'm only here about, I guess, eight months, seven or eight months now. Um, so it was, it's been hard, you know, it, um, cl uh, closing my school was very difficult for me. It was not an easy thing to do. It was a very long decision and pros and cons and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, I knew that I wanted Irish dancing to be a part of my life always, mm -hmm. but I just needed, I wanted to find that. I loved Irish dancing. I love Irish dancing, but I needed to find it again. And I think that was part of why I had to take a step back from having my own studio and my own show. Um, and, you know, I am fortunate enough that I have some workshop schools 
and um, I'm teaching here uh, with with uh, Myra Waters here in Orlando, okay. which has been fantastic, mm-hmm. um, which has just been great. So I'm able to keep that little bit of Irish dancing, you know, here as well. And um, it's just been it's been hard. It's a hard transition, but it's working out really well. Mm-hmm. Well, and people in the Irish dance world would, would know Myra. I mean, she's been around a long time. She's a you know, well-respected uh, teacher and is very established there. And so I'm going to, to broach a subject that, that, you know, I hope is not considered controversial, but some, I just want to get your opinion on this. Mm-hmm. There, there are some people who think when multiple teachers join a new school, it can be problematic. Other people think, uh, no, it's great because you're bringing in a lot of different experiences and perspectives and it's great for the kids. Others say maybe it gives that school um, an advantage over maybe a smaller school where there's one one student, I mean, one, one student, one teacher or two teachers. What's your perspective on being part of a team as opposed to doing it maybe just by yourself or maybe yourself and an assistant? Yeah, so this is the first time that I've really had uh, this kind of relationship with Irish dancing and the Irish dancing teaching world, Mm -hmm. because I always had, I did everything my own at my school, you know, when it came to choreography, the business side of it, Um, I had some help, you know, when it came to certain times of year and things like that, of course, um, from the parents, but ultimately it was up to me, but now what's interesting is when you have someone like Myra, for example, she is, is knows so much and has such great advice. And, you know, she's run such a successful school here in Orlando for years and years and years. Um, And I just, I love that we have a great working relationship and, you know, we, I love coming in somewhere into a dance studio and being able to bounce off of someone else and just, what do you think of this? And, oh yeah, what do you think about this? So in my experience, this is the only experience I can speak off of. Mm -hmm. It's been fantastic. Um, I absolutely love it. So, Mm -hmm. and now I don't know about other people, um, but for me, it's, it's, I think it's really helped me a lot um, being able to have this kind of relationship here with another teacher. It's been great. Mm -hmm. When did the decision come about to sit your ADCRG? Uh, when I was 15 years old, (laughs) no. So that was, um, that I was upset because during the pandemic, when the pandemic hit, I said, Oh, I'm not, you know, it's probably not going to be, I'll be 33, 34, 35 by the time I can actually do this because there were no exams. And then I just had turned 30 last April. I'm now 31. Um, but I'm, I was 30 and I was ready to, I was qualified to do it. I had my five years and my, and being 30 hit right on the same day. Hmm. So it was right about the same day. It's a bit and, fortuitous. Um, yeah. Yeah. So that was I, when this, uh, Spartanburg, South Carolina exam popped up, we only had, uh, two months to prepare for it really. Hmm. So I just said, you know what, let's do it. Hmm. Okay. Yep. And preparing for it the way you'd prepare for the TCRG, is it, the, is it basically the same prep? I know you don't have to dance now in the commission ADCRG, so that I guess you wouldn't have to worry so much about that. But yeah, thank God. Other, than the, yeah, other than that, is it, did you approach the prep the same way or did you have a different strategy because it's a different exam? Uh, I would say I did pull out some of my old tricks from the TCRG when it came to the uh, written Kaylee paper and the music, of course. Um, but this, you know, it this was more difficult. I was talking to someone else about this the other day. This was more difficult to prepare for now than uh, the written portion than the TCRG was for me. For some reason, maybe it's just like I'm getting older and it doesn't compute as much anymore. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure, but um, that I really had to to do work super hard on the Kaylee written specifically Mm -hmm. um, more this time, I think. But in regards to the adjudication section, I I was amazed to find out how much, you know, you really have to you have to ask people. Because um, that's, and that's what I did leading into this exam. 
and we had a Facebook group. Um, Amy Coppola start from the mid Atlantic region, started mm -hmm. a Facebook group and it was great. I mean, we had, she would have different adjudicators come on and give their experiences and, you know, give advice and things like that um, for the exam and just a great resource. And we, you know, we would do look on the previous world championships uh, websites where they had the live streaming up and we would practice judge Kaylee's together hmm. um, and things like that and just kind of interview each other and be like, well, why did you put this comment or that doesn't really match your placement and just things like that and getting you to think in a different way. So that was kind of how my prep looked for that. Um, it was a group effort, you know, it was, I definitely didn't go into this saying, I know everything and I don't need help. I needed, I wanted every little bit of information that I could get. Mm -hmm. So what is your advice for, for people who may be wanting to sit their ADCRG in the next, I don't know, a few years, or maybe 20 years in the future, who may be watching this podcast? Yeah, well, I, we'll see if they change the format of the exam, because I, I, that may be something happening down the road. But for now, I, you know, I would say really, you know, don't let your ego get in the way and just be willing to ask and be, you know, and by that, I mean, just take it all in, take any piece of advice from anybody, you know, that, and you can decide then if, you know, if that's going to be a good trick for you or not, mm -hmm. um, but have that bank of different tools to grab from. Um, you know, and use those live streams from the world championships for the Kayleys, go to different feshes if you can, you know, to practice judge and get up there and really, you, a lot of it is, is you have to triage different issues of what's this to you? What is this, 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 and, you know, timing feet. And then what if your shoe falls off? What if your hair falls out? You know, what do you, how do you approach these different things in your adjudication if at all. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, that's, that's kind of what you have to decide as you refine your craft of judging. That's what mm -hmm. I would say. Okay. And, and so now we saw a lot of public notices on Facebook about, you know, you guys being successful. Like it was just yesterday or day before or whatever it was. Uh, you personally, when you got the email, uh, you know, that email, when you get it from from your respective organization, is either going to put chills down your spine or I mean, you never know, or you're going to you know have a jubilation. You open yeah. that email and you see you passed. What were the first thoughts that went through your mind? Well, I thought it was fake. So <laughs> it was spam. Because I, no, I did because we weren't, you know, they we weren't I, we weren't expecting to get it for another two weeks. Right. So I I was I said that can't be right. And I was getting ready. I was, I've been substituting at a high school here and I'm just before the students walk in, I get this email on my phone that says you've been successful. And I, I, you know, for a second kind of said, I don't know, this can't be right. And I was like, it has to be right. This has to be real because it came from the, you know, commission office. And then my other friend that um, sat her TCRG, she said she got hers too. Mm. And then, you know, I had to moment. I couldn't have a very long moment because right. the kids were getting ready to walk in, but I had it, you know, later and called my mom and, yeah, you know, and, and called Myra or texted Myra and told her, sent her the email and stuff like that. So it was, it's great. Fantastic. The best feeling ever. Hmm. The best. It's just an amazing feeling. Well, that's good. And and, and I know I, I gave, I wish you congratulations on Facebook, but I'll wish you another one on the podcast because it's, it is a feat you. and you deserve it. Yeah. Deserve Thank that you. credit. I'm so, so excited. <laughs> is so there a excited. big sigh of relief though? It's like, okay, that's all behind me. Or, or is there something about the process that, you know, you don't have that goal to look forward to as far as the next thing to prep for? You know, some people like that, that yeah. constant challenge of goals to look forward to. I mean, you've, yeah. with the exception of, you know, great examiner, maybe in the future or something like that, you're kind of done for a while. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts yeah, about so that? I, you know, absolutely will do the great examiner and, you know, hopefully one day do my SDCRG mm. um, way down the, the road. But I really enjoyed the preparation process for this and being on Zoom with my colleagues and in talking about the different, you know, the different approaches to judging and, you know, marking and stuff like that. So I think, you know, I'm we have a zoom, we're doing another zoom on Sunday, and I'm still going to be on it. 
and still, you know, help out and, you know, do my judging because I feel like I still need to practice, you know, as much as anybody else. I want to make sure I'm, you know, spot on and have those Kayleys and, you know, everything, especially the Kayleys have those all ready to go. And um, I'm excited. I love the process of, I loved the studying process for this. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to keep working and, you know, helping out and, and joining my, joining the Facebook Zooms. Right. So have you, have you gotten your first tentative invitation to adjudicate at FS yet? Or is it still oh, already? Yeah, they don't I wait, have. do they? <laughs> Within like, yeah, I, I'm really, really fortunate. Um, it was, I have three so far. So um, that's really cool. Um, really grateful. And, you know, I would just love to, I would love to judge as much as possible. You know, um, that's just so cool. I love the idea of it. And I'm so excited to actually do it officially. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, you know, if you follow, as I know you do, and, and I do as well, you know, people who've been judging for a long time, uh, especially now that, that COVID sort of subsided and you can, you know, more or less freely, freely travel that you follow your friends online and they're, they're jet setting here and there and they're checking in here and there does obviously you do, you don't mind traveling or you wouldn't have set the ADCRG, but does that a part, that part appeal to you maybe more than other aspects or what aspect of judging are you looking forward to most? So I'm, yes, that's great. And I think that's really exciting and you get to meet new people judging and, and mm -hmm. things like that. But I love being able to sit there and watch dancers from other schools and other you know other teachers other regions and really just be able to learn and appreciate you know what they're doing because i love to see how different people hear music and their choreography and i'm big into choreography i love making up steps mm -hmm. so this you know i i just love to i hope to be inspired and i'm just so excited to to be out there and, and see these little, you know, and I'm sure some, some judges have seen little babies grow up all the way to championship level as yeah. they've judged over the years. So it's just, it, being a judge is so paramount in this Irish dance puzzle. Um, and I'm, I'm just really grateful to be able to mm -hmm. do it. There is a fair amount of criticism that judges get uh, you've seen it out there. I've seen it out there. We've all seen it out there. Probably we've talked about it from time to time with different people we know and judges get a lot of criticism right or wrong about their results. Oh, this, this judge is corrupt and this competition seems to be rigged and all this kind of stuff. And they say, well, it's going to take the next generation of judge to write the ship. Now I, I'm not saying it's right or wrong. I'm just saying this is stuff that people talk about. You are the next generation of judge. How do you ensure you are, 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 are judging and, and setting, I guess, a good high standard uh, for yourself as a judge where people can't come back and say, well, that old JR, you know, we don't know about his result. At the, at the cusp of your experience as a judge right now, how are you planning, I guess, to, to establish yourself as a respected judge? Yeah, so I, I personally honestly think that our judges that we have do right by these kids. I really, I do believe that. And I think it's different when you're judging. It's, it's just, it's a different, it's easy to, to be back here and to say one, two, three, four, whatever. But it's, it's different when you're at the table because I, for me personally, you have to respect the work that these kids put in and their teachers put in. And every single child that steps onto stage deserves, you know, deserves that time from you. Um, and that's, that's my, you know, that's what I can say for me. Um, I really, I really do honest to God, believe that. And every single kid deserves their time, deserves the respect, deserves feedback. You know, um, that's what they're there for. And, you know, they love comments. I just know as, as a teacher, how much I appreciated when judges would write specific comments mm -hmm. and, and things that I'm like, wow, I, you know, I never thought about that before, but that's a really great comment. I just want to give great feedback 
And I want to see the kids grow as dancers, appreciate the work that they're putting in and, um, you know, give them the respect that they deserve because I know how hard they work. Mm -hmm. Looking out a few years in the future. Now I know anything can happen, but where do you see your experiences as a, as a TCRG and now starting to become an, you know, you are an ADCRG, but you're just starting your path there. Where would you like to see things go for you in the next, say, five years? So I would say I love to, you know, obviously judge mm -hmm. um, and experience some new regions and, and, and meet new people and new friends and continue growing that. Um, and continue the teaching as well and the choreography and, and the aspects of Irish dancing that I love. And um, that, that would be great for me, you know, in the next five years. Maybe I would be awesome to judge an Arakta somewhere mm -hmm. sometime um, and, you know, ultimately judge a world way down the road would mm -hmm. be really cool. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. Uh... Is there is there some far flung place that you you have to make sure and judge one day while while you're a judge, or is it just wherever you, wherever life takes you? Is there one place that you just you have on your your bucket list? I, I have to go and judge here. I'd love to judge in Australia, so that would be really cool. But honestly, I would go anywhere. You know, I'm just grateful for the opportunity. So anyone that would invite me to come judge, I would be grateful. But I, I Australia's always been a place not just to go judge at because the dancing is great there, but just to visit because mm -hmm. it's such a beautiful place. So that would definitely be one of my top places. Surely you've thought about what the, the experience might be the first time you sit behind the desk and you've got your piece of paper there. You're looking at your fellow judges. You're looking around the musicians. Some people you probably know, maybe some people you don't. Here comes the first little dancer in front of you. Have you thought about what that might feel like? Yeah, I mean, I experienced it a little bit in the exam and it's a little bit of panic because you just it really what it is for me is I feel like it's going to be I want to do right by these kids. And that's that is the pressure that I put on myself is to make sure. And I know, you know, I know I will, but just to make sure that I'm doing right by them. And that's that might be the little bit of nerves to start out. Um, but other than that, you know, I feel really confident to to get out there and do it and and give some good feedback. Mm -hmm. Well, very good. Well, Jr., I think we are going to conclude that here. That's that's some very good experiences you've been able to share. Uh, you know, very in inspiring and in some of your background there as far as, you know, working your way up to the levels and teaching and uh, you know, you've got some great experiences. And I, I wish you all the best. You know, as I say, you're you're a young judge. And I know you've got lots of experiences to make. And uh, I just say, make it count. You know, you only go around once. Make those experiences count. Yeah. And I know you will. Thanks so much, Richard. Really appreciate it.